Hey, good morning, everybody. Good morning. Thank you, Lawrence, for sharing. Isn't it awesome to see what God's doing across this world? Amen. And you're part of it. I love every time when he said it, you're part of it. You are part of it, right? You're busy reaching people in China and in Burma. Um, and uh, it's, it's so fantastic to know, Lawrence, that you are really, I believe you, you are fulfilling God's mandate on your life. And we look forward to just hearing greater report, right? There's going to be a greater increase. Um, and we believe for just more to be released in your own life and in your family's life, right? Greater opportunities. And as you continue to be obedient, more doors are going to open. And God's going to use you as a mighty man of God. No, we, we believe that. So, so let's just bless Lawrence and his family. Just give him a round of applause, not for, for them as people, but just to say, God, thank you for using them. And if you don't want to bless them, just say, God, thank you that I don't have to go. <laughs> so that's what some people are thinking, right? Yeah, I don't want to go to jail. <laughs> um, so uh, just, just a quick note, which I, I want to encourage you to know about something that we have in our church. We believe if we can raise up a new generation um, knowing God and having God in their hearts, um, as we move forward, as we see these kids grow up, what's going to happen is they're going to be people and, and adults that's, that's going to be like just on fire for God with every, all the right things in their hearts. So one of the things we do to encourage that is we've got something called buddy mail. Some of you might have seen it. Some of you haven't seen it. Some of you have taken a letter and you've responded. Some of you haven't. So what we do is we encourage our kids uh, once a month. We want them to write uh, a letter with a prayer request on it. And then inside they put the letter. And then what we put it up on a board just outside Kingdom Kids. And then what we want you to do is we would like you to go and just take one of the letters. And we want you to pray over that child and over the request that that child has placed inside of the letter. And then also we would like for you to write them back. There's, there's nothing more than kids like than receiving mail. They love it. They love it. Every time we open up the mail, Andrew and Kelly wants to know if there's something for them. Um, and, and they love receiving mail. So, so here's a simple example. Some of you don't know how, how easy or how complicated it might be. Can you drop it a little bit still, John? Sorry. So, so here's the letter from one of the kids. It is, hi, my name is, I'm not going to reveal the name. Um, I'm 10 years old, and I'm not doing very good in math at school. So can you pray for me to understand more of math? Thank you. Right? Simple, simple request. So here's the response. Dear, um, thank you for reaching out to God and to me with your prayer requests. Asking for God's help is always a great first step when you are having difficulties in your life. I will pray for God to open your mind to math. I will pray for Him to grant you wisdom in this area and the confidence to try your best. Never be discouraged. As the Bible tells us in Philippians 4.13, I can do all things through Christ who strengthens me. God is good. And whether or not you are getting better in math, I know that God is working in you and bringing you to where He wants you to be. Like He told Jeremiah, Before I formed you in the womb, I knew you. God has wonderful plans for you and for your life. <laughs> I think it's the coffee. Trying hard in areas where it's difficult is the most excellent way. It's how we learn. Persevere in your tasks and keep praying. Keep God in your heart and He'll always be with you. May God bless you and keep you, your friend in Christ. That's awesome. You know, I think that the reason I get emotional about this is because I remember in school, some of you might have heard this, and, and these flowers are going to get stepped on. Thank you, Murray Bond, for the flowers, but I have to move them. Um, 
You know, some of you, it's, you might have heard this. When I was in school, um, I had dyslexia. And I struggled to read. And my teacher would make me stand up and read in front of the class so that everybody could laugh at me. Uh, and you know, <laughs> to have people in our lives that will come against the awful attacks of the world, for our kids, man, that is the most powerful thing there is. These letters, you know, it's a, it's a small thing, but it moves mountains. It's, it's, it's so I encourage you, let's sow into our kids. Let's sow into their lives. Let's sow and see dreams that might have been shattered by, by people that have come into their lives f- through the enemy, I believe. And sometimes it's not even on purpose, but through, through words that have shattered kids' hearts with discouragement, these letters can change their future. I believe it. So, so let's pray for them, and, and let's, let's go empty that wall and please respond. If the letter is gone, they know that it's gone. They go and check. So make sure that you bring it back. Okay, so, so please try and, and let's, let's bless our kids. I'm, I'm, I really believe that God wants to do something through it. Okay, so let's get into the marriage message. Um, <laughs> <laughs> God is, we, we've been talking about God is. Um, and it's the, the theme, and we're going to probably do it for another two or three weeks because there's so much that God is that we can't get through it in just one month. We probably have to do it two months. So um, God is. God is. The first week we looked at God is strong, looked at He's the creator of the universe. We've looked at God is able. He's not only strong, He has the ability to do something in our lives. We looked at God is love. Um, it's not that we loved God first. It's not that, that God loves sometimes. It's not God is love sometimes. When I mess up, God's not love anymore. Then God's something. No, God's always love. God loved us before we were His children. God loves the world. God loves every single person that decided not to follow Him. And because of the consequence, might spend an eternity away from Him. God loves them still the same. God is always love. God is hope. We know that there's, there's so much times in our lives when we don't have hope. And the one thing that we always know is God is always hope. That never changes. There's always hope. No matter how dismal or how dark or, or how lost your situation might feel, God is hope. This morning, we're going to look at God is limitless. God is limitless. Now, I know for some people it kind of seems the same as God is strong, God is able, God is hope, God is love, God is limitless. Um, is it really something different? Yes, it is. Um, limitations are something we all have. We all have limitations in our lives. And if I say to you God is limitless, for most of us what we think is, well, yeah, you know, yeah, God is limitless, that's great, you know, God. But really what does that mean for me? What does it mean to me? every single day of my life to know that God is limitless. God is limitless means that uh, we know that that He's all-powerful. Yes, we know that. We we know that God is the resources on on all the hills, but how does it impact my life every single day of my life? To know that I have a God that is limitless. There's no boundaries to Him. We read in the Bible, it says, God has no boundaries to His love and His strength. His grace is never ending, and His mercies are new every morning. It's beautiful. It's in the Bible, but how does it impact my daily life? To know that God is limitless. How does it change my financial status or situation that is limited? I mean, it's great to know that God is limitless, but my financial situation is still limited. How does it change my my marriage because within my relationship with my wife, there are a lot of limitations. There are a lot of areas where, where it feels like I'd, I'm not married. And if you're saying God is limitless, how does it impact that? Um, how does it change my, my health, my working, my going, my being, my doing? How does it impact that? So I was busy praying, praying for, for us as a church. Um, and 
preparing this word, and what I saw while I was praying is, is many times when I prepare a word, it's like um, I pray over it, and then what happens is God will show me something for the congregation, or I will see something. And this week, it was something that I saw. I'm busy praying. I'm saying, God, I'm mean, talking about you being limitless, but what does it mean for us? And then what I saw is above every single head, I saw one of these speed limit signs. Some at 40 miles an hour, some at 10 miles an hour, some at 80 miles an hour, um, some at 60. It was all, everybody had a different speed limit above their head. Everybody had this different sign above their head. And then, and then I said, God, so what are you saying through this? He's saying the limitations that people place on me is the sign that's above their head. So for some of them, I'm only limited to 10 miles an hour. For some of them, I'm, I'm only limited to 40 miles an hour, and to some, I'm limited to, to much more. And, and in this congregation, we have the whole sliding scale. From new believers that don't know anything about God and who many times are actually more like children believing that God can do all things to those that have been in here, been in prayer teams, prayer meetings, leadership teams, everything you might have grown up in church. And what's happened is your, your, what you might have learned or experienced in church or in your life has caused your speed limit to decrease to about 10 miles an hour. You might have started off at 100 miles an hour. I know when I started, um, when I received God in my life um, at age of 19, and for the first time realized that God is not just a theology, it's not just a building, it's not just a Bible. God is a every single day of my life um, relationship, speaking with me, realizing that the Holy Spirit is real, that He wants to communicate with me. He wants to talk to me. He wants to show me His plans and His dreams and His, His purposes. When I realized that, I was busy studying um, accounting combined with sports economics, and I went to, to, to university, and, and the only thing that I wanted to know more about at that point in time was God, nothing more. I started reading the Bible, and for some other reason, the stuff that I've read before now suddenly became alive to me and things that I've seen before um, as just words in the word became alive to me. And I became like, I, I mean, I was running in gears, man. I was full speed on fire for God. Um, you know, people, and I it was a little bit of Bible bashing, you know, uh, Andres, what are you reading? I'm reading my Bible. If you have a problem with that, talk to God. Um, <laughs> you know, in class. Um, so I, I failed miserably that year because um, the Bible didn't really help um, with that. But then I went into Bible school and you get on fire and, and you want to go into ministry and, and, and our limitations, like, like we're running, right? And then sometimes we hit an obstacle and, and that 100 miles an hour drops to 90, right? Our, our fire dro just drops down. Ooh, you know, it's hit a pothole. Something happens. And for us, there's so many different limitations in this room, and I ask God, so God, how do we get people back to a place of knowing that you're limitless? Because it's, gonna be, it's, not, it's not, man, you're going to be limitless right now. We understand God is limitless. Okay, we, we get it. God, you're limitless, and suddenly we just know it. No, our understanding has to grow. I said, I said so God, how do I change this, the signs above people's heads? Uh, how do we get it to change where, where it is an, an infinity sign? Our God is limitless. There's, there's endless possibilities. We can't even imagine of the possibilities that He has for our lives. He says that what you do is you take them one step at a time. We have to take one step at a time. I can't take all of you all the way there, but I know that we can, if we continue to apply God's Word, the principles of His Word to our lives, I know every time we apply it, we are taking another step in understanding that He is limitless that there's no impossibility with Him. So it's one step at a time. So this morning, we're going to start taking one more step and because God wants us to catch up. He does. He wants us to catch up to, to the endless possibilities that's in your life, for the dreams, the purposes, the plans that He has for you. He wants you to catch up to it. Amen? Amen? Like, I want to, honestly. Like, I mean, I want to be more on fire than I've ever been. I remember the day I got saved and I thought, man, I was crazy on fire. I want to be more than that. I want to go further than that. So there's no limitations apart from the one that you put upon yourself. In God, I want you to know that. You determine how much you want to follow Him. You determine how much you want to surrender. You determine how much you want to listen, how close you want to be. 
You determine that, how much you want to experience them. It's not God. A lot of times we think we had a great worship meeting the, the, this week where our worship team gathered together. We've had a great meeting with our prayer team. And there's unity in the body because what we have, have come to understand is that our purpose for why we come together and worship is not to beg or plead God to do something on our behalf. God, would you please do something? And if we beg Him enough, He might respond. Like I said, yeah, maybe God is saying, if they just sing the chorus once more, it is well, it is well, then I'll make it well. We th- you know, that's not the purpose of worship. It's not the purpose of prayer. The purpose of worship and prayer is so that our hearts lines up with whom He is and what He has already done. So when I sing it as well, it is well with my soul, I'm not asking God, make it well with my soul. God has made your soul well already. You have to line yours up with what He's done. See, we have to understand the purpose of things. So, so you get as close to God as you want to be. Um, God is not limiting, limiting you. You are limiting yourself. I'm going to go fast because I have to get there. So for some of you to change limitations, you have placed on yourself. You have to go back years, and that's what I started off. You have to go back years. Some of us are limited by things we were told as kids. You will never be. You will never be that good. You will never make it. Don't even try. There's only 3% in the world that makes that. Don't think that you can be one of the 3%. I love driving with my kids and speaking about purpose and destiny and dreams. I love it. I love it. I honestly, I love it. I I want them to bring dream bigger than what I can imagine. I want them to dream bigger and greater than what I think their abilities are. I encourage them to think bigger. That when, when I speak to Angel, and you know, so Angel loves hockey. I said, so Angel, what do you want to be when you grow up? Well, I, well, he started off by wanting to be an astronaut, and then he wanted to be a pastor. So then he wanted to be an astronaut pastor. <laughs> um, and then it's changed into he wants to be the best um, goalie in the NHL. So it's great. And then he said, but after that, I want to be a GM of, of an NHL. And I said to him, and after that? He said, what do you mean after that? I said, after that. Like, w- what else after that? He said, well, maybe president. I said, okay, that's great. Um, what's after that? He said, then I die. I said, okay, good. So, <laughs> so th- those are good things, right? Encourage them to dream. There's no impossibility for God. If we give up on our dreams as kids because our dad told us, well, you're too dumb. You're not strong enough. You can never do that. No. We have to be the ones that encourage you because many of us, we have limited God because people limited us. We were limited by people's words, by people's viewpoints, by somebody's comment. Somebody said something about you that you were listening to. They weren't speaking to you, but speaking to somebody else. And somewhere some hurt came into you. And because that hurt came into you, now suddenly there's a limitation that's causing you to hold yourself back from where God wants you to be. Like God has these dreams and these purposes, and it's like, yes, I want to push into it, right? I'm going to go for it, go for it. And it's almost like a bungee cord that's around you that every step you're taking forward, it's like, uh, it's pulling me back, and you take another step. And eventually what happens is all these hurts of your past actually accelerate you further back, and a lot of people give up on God because of the limitations that people have placed upon them. So this morning, the first thing that we have to do is we have to remove the limitations. So I, I was driving, um, and I saw the sign. I loved the sign. Um, Reclamation Center. You know what God said to me this morning, and I want to hear all of you to hear me. God is reclaiming dreams and purpose and destiny and calling and life today. God is reclaiming it. What the enemy has stolen, God is reclaiming today. I wrote, you know, I'm, I'm, I'm a, I, I, it's almost like I feel like this morning, this is a reclaiming center. The things that the enemy has stolen, you know, many times we think something is lost. Um, we look at something in our lives and we look at it and we see, you know, there's, there's a piece of rock, it's got mud on it and it used to be a jewel, but now it's dirty. And you think, you know, what can I do with that? No, let me just disregard that, and I'll get a new one. I'll get a new jewel. 
You need to know there's jewels here this morning that's your purpose and your destiny that simply because it's been covered by mud and muck and people talking nonsense and people not knowing the greatness that is inside of you, many of you have thrown those things and God's saying this morning we are going to reclaim the jewels that are lost. The things that are covered with mud, our response normally is, I'll get a new one that is clean. No, the new one's going to get dirty also. Why? Because you are carrying a mud along with you. And this morning, we are going to take those jewels that is your purpose and your destiny. And because God is limitless, we are going to say, God, we are reclaiming that which is lost. I know you're going to make it new. So we are called we are called to be, um, I, I want to say, agents of God's reclaiming center. Your life should be about reclaiming people's dreams and visions. And, you know, I, I love seeing different avenues where, where there's people coaching, like Greg calling himself a coach and speaking over kids. I love looking at that from the side and seeing how, how a person's voice influences somebody to, to lift them up again. I love seeing it in counseling where somebody comes in and says, you know, there's no hope for my relationship. And just having that one word of saying, with God there is hope. Don't look at the circumstances right now. Know that God's got a better plan. And to see how that person, the mud that's on him, is being rinsed off because that's what encouragement and hope does to people. It rinses them from the muck the devil tries to put upon them. So I love seeing it. And each and every single one of us, we are called to be agents of this, this, uh, this reclaiming, this cleaning center of encouragement. People around us, must, they must want to be around us. Why? Because I'm cleaning them off constantly by the word of encouragement. You must be the life giver to them. So we are all called to be that. So um, we're going to look at a story in the Bible. Um, and yes, we will turn to it. Um, it's a story about Elisha. And before we get to the story, I want to say to you this morning, God is saying to you, this is the following things that I believe there's more, but some of the things he wants to reclaim is he's going to reclaim the seed that was sown in your life. You know, we've preached the word in this body to a lot of people. And many times we think the seed, the word that was spoken has been lost. But this morning, I want to make a declaration that every single word that has flown from God's throne room into people's hearts and to their ears will not be lost. The seed will be reclaimed. The seed that you have sown, the business where you've invested in, the, the areas where you've sown seed, and I want you to, to say, know that God can reclaim that. Now, there are, there's grace. I want you to know that God's grace is always there for us. But don't think grace is, is something that comes with stupidity. Because sometimes we do things out of stupidity, and then we expect God to save it when he's clearly instructed us differently. We have to understand that there's, also con there's always consequence for decision. But what we have as believers is God's grace comes and he can change the consequence of the decisions that we've made into something that becomes a testimony. We have to be open to that. We have to be open to how God will take a situation and change it where we've chosen wrong. So, so please understand that. Okay, so here's a story in the Bible. It's, it's about Elisha. Um, and the story we're going to read in 2 Kings. But just to, here's a little bit of detail about Elisha. Elisha's busy speaking to a widow who's going through difficulty. Her husband just died. Now, Elisha himself is somebody who knows what it means to get rid of limitations in his life. Because he had to do it himself. He had to break off of limitations to follow God's call for his life. He had to... Go and do certain things to make sure that is in God's plan. So Elisha was a young man, and Elijah came to him and said, follow me. So Elijah said to Elisha, follow me. And, and Elisha's response was, just give me a moment to go and say goodbye to my parents. First limitation that Elisha had to break down was he had to break from his family tradition. Now for us as believers, I want you to hear, if God's calling you, for many of you, it might mean that you have to take a step that's in a different direction than where your family might be going. 
Many times our family and, and those people listening online, I want to say to you, if, if you are stuck in a church where you're not ministered life and you're simply there because your family goes there, but you know God is calling you to more, I want to encourage you to take that step and say, God, I want to follow you. It's not throw your family away, but go and greet them and share with them the vision and the purpose that God has placed on your heart and where you want to go. But it's important for us to take those steps. Elisha had to say goodbye to his parents in order to follow God's plans for his life. Many times we follow in the footsteps of our father's 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 father and business and structures. And I'm, please hear me. I'm not saying anybody. Hear me. Don't go quit your job. Okay? I'm very clear. Don't, I'm not telling anybody to quit their, their jobs. What I am saying is if God is calling you into something specific, Make sure you have him with his confirmation on your heart and from different people before you take those steps. And then take them in wisdom. Okay? Disclosure. Read the fine print. Okay, so, but many times we get stuck into a profession simply because that's what our, 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 our parents have always done. And many times we see dreams, purposes, and plans of God missed because of that. So, for Elisha, he had to go and break it off and say, God, um, Mom, Dad, love you, but I'm going to follow God's plans for my life. Because God's got a specific plan for every single one of us. And sometimes it might be to take over your dad's business or your uncle's business or whatever it might be. Sometimes it might be that. But we have to understand that sometimes it's difficult to do it. So that's the first thing they had to do. The second thing he had to do is he had to go and burn his plow. He said to Elijah, just wait. I have to go burn my plow. The plow was the thing he lived from. It's what he made his living from. Full disclosure, nobody quits and burns plows because I'm saying burning plows now. Right? Please hear me. I don't want you in my office on Tuesday. I resigned yesterday. Okay, I'm going to work for God. What can I do? I, nothing. I've got nothing for you to do. You have to figure out what God's call is for you. If God's calling you into something, make sure you know what it is before you burn your plow. You know where he was going. He knew whom he was following. He knew what direction he was going in. So don't go burn plows and, and then it's happened, right? It's happened to so many people who have great intentions in their heart. They rededicate their lives to God, and suddenly the first thing that they want to do is work full-time in ministry. And I believe God has called them to ministry, but in the marketplace, where their skills and their abilities are. Some people are called to full-time ministry. I, I know that. But please hear me, that to burn your plow, and it's not easy. Why do we have to burn our plow? Because if we keep... It's like a back door open. It always seems attractive when things get hard. When we moved here um, from South Africa, we had to burn our plow in many different ways. We owned a theater in South Africa, and for the first year, we tried to run it from here. We had 106 people on staff. It was a 400 seat. It was functioning six days a week. It, it was a, a big setup, a lot of people involved with it. And, and we did shows, live shows, every single day with bands and with music. I was in, in, in the entertainment industry. Um, and I would have auditions over Skype for people on this side. They had to audition with the Skype, the camera on them. And I'd watch them, listen to them, um, see their skill. And then we'd cast them from Canada. I'll tell the guy in South Africa, OK, this one's good, this one's good. Put them in the show. That's how we do it. And then every once in a while, we would go back. We would go watch the show. We would, we would change it. But when things got hard, and we, we it is, honestly, following God is not, it's not an easy road always, right? And by easy, I mean it's not that there's not going to be obstacles. It has been the easiest thing in my life because it gives life, right? I've never, I've never felt like I've been alive until I started doing it. Until I followed God's plan, I was living, but I wasn't alive. So, so in that, many times what would happen is I would think to myself, you know what, yeah, things aren't working out 100%. They said no five times. And I'm saying say no five because they <laughs> said no five times. Um, 
in the church for work, for ministry, volunteering, asking to serve? No. I, so I can't serve? No. Okay. Um, can I sing? No. Okay. C- can I, can I, um, what can I do? Well, nothing. Okay, then I'll just sit in the foyer and I'll serve. No. And Elisha was said to no five times. Elijah said to Elisha, go home, go back. Elisha said, no, I'm following what God has placed upon my heart. I'm going to follow it. He said, go home, Elisha. No, I'm going to follow what God... And after the fifth time, what happened? He received a double portion of Elijah's anointing. Because what? He knew what God was calling him to. See, if we're going towards something that God is calling us, when we hear no, God's calling me, people will say no. And the difficulty is when we have plows and other options available, they become beautiful, even though it's not your calling. So we had to step back, Give the business over, eventually close it. We had to sell our home and everything else we had there to make a move because if we kept it, you know how easy it is to just fly back because I've got a home there. You have to cut it off. So for some of you, there's, there's some things that you might have to cut off to get rid of the limitation. So Elisha knew exactly how to minister to this woman because she was limiting God and he knows how to deal with limitations. So this morning, I want to say to you, I know his advice is good. I've applied it to my life, and it's worked. It's from God's word. I hope that you can apply it to your life also. So, so here's the advice from Elisha. So he's speaking to this, this, this lady who's a widow now. And um, he's going to have a conversation with her. And the response that he gives her is not the response she expects. In the same way, I'm going to say, I'm going to give you some, some things this morning that might not be the response that you were hoping for, for the limitations that you have in your life. I said, and, and it's true that there's maybe everything you, in your life is more limited than it's limitless. But I want to encourage you, do not let the limitations advise you on the things of God. Do not let your limitations advise you on the things of God. Because it will stop you every time. Because if it was just within your own skill or own ability, faith is not required. Why trust then? Okay, so... The speed limit the enemy wants to put on all of us is one that keeps us from getting God to a place where he becomes limitless in our lives. The enemy wants us to stay anchored. He wants you to stay where where you are at. He doesn't want you to think of God being all-powerful. He wants you to say, I can't do it. He wants you to say, you know what, I've tried and it didn't work. And then what happens many times when we've tried something and it doesn't work, we create a theology out of it, a new doctrine, and we form a new church where God is limited in a certain way. But I want to say, I want to dare you. I want to dare you. You know, you know in the, what's a practical thing? How does it start? Let's just start practical on, on a Sunday morning. I dare you to show up at 9.45 for coffee. I dare you. Why? Because in the fellowship of believers, God moves. If you're here just for the service and you duck off, how do you give the other believers an opportunity to speak God's word over you? Our prayer team gathers before the service. Why? With the heart and the intention to receive from God to bless his people. You show up at 10. They can't pray for you. I don't allow them to pray for you at 10 because then it's worship time. Yes, it starts at 10. I want to encourage you. It's a, you know, you want to decrease God's limitation in your life? Let's start honoring His service. It's a small thing. Let's maybe, I know, maybe some of you are like a one-hand raiser in worship. You know, like I said, I remember when, when I just got saved and it was brand new to me and everybody else was like, yeah, you know, uh, you know going crazy. I had the like the, the really low Heil Hitler right down here, you know, and then it, then it became both hands, you know, and, and then I kind of turned them around because he said receive, um, 
and, and it's easier to do this than this because this way your arms really get tired over here. So, and then I kind of started going from over here to here. And then some mornings I find myself starting over here because I know I want to be here, but there's people around me and I feel, ah, people are what I'm going to think. So then I, then I start here, but then my fingers kind of go loose and I'm over here. And then sometimes my hands are raised. And, and what, what, why do I raise my hands? Because the word says our praise starts with a surrender. Surrendering of your own thinking, your own understanding to God, saying, God, I surrender to you. And the first word in praise um, in the Hebrew that, that, that we find is the word tahila, which means I surrender. My hands are up. I surrender to you, God. Start with a small thing like that. Start with a small thing like saying, you know what? Yeah, I am going to join the prayer team that's that's going to be it. And then you know, but the problem is the devil wants to limit you and you know what he uses to limit us as believers other believers. Doesn't use the world because they're not in here. Critique, comments. You know, you know so oh you're sitting in the front row now. All holy holy, right? <laughs> yeah. M- moved up. Joining a pulse group are you? Want to be part of the leadership, eh? Yeah. I do 30. You do 30 also. Don't, don't come and pass me. Don't go by me. W- what's up with you? I'm surrendering. Enemy says, don't do it. God says, go for it. I dare you. I dare you to take the principles of his word and apply it. I dare you to pray for somebody who's sick. I dare you to. You know why? Because if you do, you're releasing me to do something in their lives. I dare you to surrender and say, amen, I agree. Thank you very much. I dare you. I dare you to, to just say, God, I surrender. I dare you to, because what's going to happen is the limitations that you've placed on him is going to change. Okay, so let's get to the word. So, Second Kings four, um, and this is the widow. And I believe this message is going to speak to some people this morning very loud and clear because we're going to get into it now in the last five minutes. Second Kings four, the wife of a man from the company of prophets cried out to Elisha. So, first thing we learn. The wife. In those days, a wife was a female. (laughs) Just to clarify. (laughs) The wife of a man from the company of prophets. She was in the company of prophets. She wasn't new to believers, she wasn't an outsider. She was somebody that knew what the gathering of the prophets were. She, she was in touch with God. She knew who he was. Okay? She was in the company of prophets. She said the following, Your servant, my husband, is dead. And you know that he revered the Lord. He served the Lord. He followed the Lord. He was close to God. He was dedicated to God. You know that he was dedicated to God. So here's the first limitation. You can hear us saying, this guy loved God, but also being angry with his death. Your servant who followed God is dead. Your servant who followed God is dead. But now his creditor is coming to take away my two boys as his slaves. Second limitation, debt. She has debt. The first thing is, she's got anger and bitterness. He followed God. He served God. He prayed. Second thing, he's dead and now they're coming to take my boys. Third limitation, intimidation and fear. She has debt And now she has fear that her sons will be taken away. Her husband has died. She's angry about it. She has debt because of that. And now 
the, the people that she owes the money to who's going to come and take her boys as slaves. So she has been in the company of prophets. She's been in the company of pastors, conferences, spiritual teaching, meetings, prayer group meetings, um, been in church, been teaching church, Bible school, prayer ministries, whatever you can think of. She's been there. She's had all of it. But now she's freaking out in fear. She is worried. And because of her anger, God is limited. And because of the debt, God is limited. And because of the fear, God is limited. So we have to get rid of those limitations. The first thing that we have to do, and, and this is what happens, is we go so many times, I've seen people go from the one extreme, from the highest of high, serving together to low not understanding what is happening, what is going on. He served you. He loved you. We prayed. We did everything. And God, you still took him. People go from highs to lows. God, we served you in our business. We tithed. We gave offerings. And the business is gone. I don't understand it. And, and those things that we, we get angry about becomes a limitation. So the first thing that we need to do to get over that limitation or get over that situation that you're in is... You have to move yourself, and you have to ask for help. You have to move yourself and ask for help. We have to ask. People think in the church that we can't ask for help because God's the provider of all my needs. Yes, He is the provider of all your needs. I do believe that, but please hear me. Sometimes God actually uses people, right? He uses people that's obedient and listening. But if we, if, you know, faith is not fake. I'm not standing in fake. I'm standing in faith, believing that God will influence me through His creation, through His people. Stop lying to yourself. You need help. There's people that, that come for, for different levels of counseling and saying by you need help. Um, it, I'm not saying please call on Monday and fill up the calendar with counseling. What I am saying is, you have to understand that certain people, if you're struggling with finances, go see somebody that can help you with your budget. Go see somebody that's good in it. It's not, well, I've prayed. Well, yes, you've prayed, fantastic. God, what happens in our prayer? Is God moved by our, you know, prayer? Is God going to, well, they prayed to us, now I'm going to do something. No, in your prayer, God is declared he becomes greater your problems become lower you get wisdom and you go see somebody that can help you we have to we have to take action the word is very proactive asking is a proactive step in getting to the place where we get better where god's limitations are removed you're struggling with your relationship they are fantastic marriage counselors that you have to go see, but you have to decide. Nobody's going to move your chair for you. Remember last week we sp spoke about the green seats and the gold seats. The green seats are the cheap seats where your view is obstructed by your problems, by your difficulties. And most of us, we want to sit in the gold seats where our life is filled with God's kingdom, but we only want to pay the green seats price. And we get angry when people don't move us. I want, Pastor, I want you to move me. You move my marriage. I'm coming to see you. You must fix it. I can't fix anything. Nothing. I can give you God's counsel. I can give you God's wisdom. I can show you God's grace. But I can't fix it. You have to decide if you want to move your seat. Nobody can move your seat for you. Stop saying, I'm praying and I'm expecting God to do something. God wants you to take the next step through prayer. You'll receive wisdom. If you're not receiving wisdom, then check your prayer. Because then it might just be complaining and moaning. And I don't think he's listening to that. Because he's already paid for all of that. We have to understand that moving our seats, taking the next step, and getting God to be limitless is a step of faith that each and every single one of us have to take. You have to take the next step and be honest and say, I need help. Go and see people. And then there's something else that you have to do. Follow their instruction. You go see somebody that shows you how to do a budget. That's fantastic. I'm going to do it my own way. Why do you go see them then? 
Why do you come for counseling if you don't want to listen to the counsel? I see people twice. If I see by the second time they haven't applied the principles that I spoke about the first time, I say, good night. I can refer you to somebody else because I, I, I know God's word for me is almost too valuable to see people not applying it. I want you to apply God's word to your life. And, and I know many times we get so, like, like that guy that was sitting next to the pool of Potesta, um, he was sitting there for 38 years, and what was his complaint? His complaint was, nobody's picking me up and putting me in the pool. And we want, what did Jesus do when he walked by? Gently picked him up and placed him in the pool? No, he said, get up. I'm not going to pick you up. Get up. Take your mat. Take your chair and walk. Go home. We have to apply those principles to our lives. If we want to move, apply the principles. So, so she's, she is um, complaining. Um, she's limited. We must know that faith is not fake. Um, we should not be scared to ask. We have to ask. We have to ask. The word is proactive. It's, 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 you probably heard the story about the guy that was drowning. And a helicopter showed up, right? And he said, no, 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 I'm afraid. I'm good. I'm praying to God. God will save me. And he's still drowning. And then a boat shows up from Africa. <laughs> and he's, he's, come, we'll help you out of the water. You're drowning. No, 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 I'm good. I'm good. I'm afraid. God will help me. And then the guy dies. He goes to heaven. He said, God, what's up with that? I prayed. I believed you will help me. He said, yes, I was trying to help you, but you were so stuck on thinking that praying means sitting that you didn't receive the salvation that I'm sending. And salvation doesn't always come just from within a church member. It comes from everywhere. God can use anything, anybody. His resources are limitless. He will send a person from China to come save a person in Africa or in, in Canada where we are. <laughs> right? God will use anybody. I love the story about my, my friend Skulk. He was, um, you know, the whole story, he didn't have money. Um, we felt we have to send money. We sent money. He got the money three months later after people said to him, if God wants you to go, God will send money. He, you know, so we sent the money. He, without him knowing we sent the money, without us knowing what he needed the money for, uh, people criticizing him for stepping out in faith. Money shows up. Everybody, wow. It's great. Uh, then he c gets on the plane. He flies to Scotland, um, gets there, says, God, what do you want me to do? He said, I want you to go to a bridge. Where's the bridge? It's on a golf course. He says, great. How do I get there? Goes to the, and finds out that the only way you can get to the bridge on the golf course is you have to play. I mean, amen, God sent me. Um, <laughs> I'll go to bridges. So um, then ends up, he gets paired up with a person um, who has terminal cancer, six weeks left to live. Um, he leads the guy to meet God on the bridge that God showed him three months ago where he should go. And, and he said to me, you know the thing that God told me through this whole thing? is He said, I'll send people across the world to meet you. God is limitless in his resources. Amen. Okay, so I have to really speed up. So, I'm sorry. So, so we have to understand that we have to ask. Ask, ask. Ask your neighbors to come to the Lindy McCauley conference. Conference, morning. First of March, right here. She's going to speak to their hearts. She's fantastic. Um, she's got the third, they have the third biggest church in the world. And she was one of the planters. She and her husband started the church. Um, like I said, she was the counsel for Nelson Mandela. When we came out of apartheid in South Africa, the two people that Nelson Mandela had next to him regarding spiritual counsel of the country was Ray and Lindy McCauley. Uh, she's got an incredible word, March 1st. Invite somebody. Don't be scared to ask. I've asked my neighbor on the one side. He said, no, no, I don't want to mess up my relationship on the other side. You're going to get no's. You're going to get no's. You know, um, if you've got a heart for ministry, ask people. Ask somebody who has a building. Hey, do you have a building? You know, and, and we are so scared in the church to ask because we think, oh, money's going to come from heaven somehow, right? 
it's just going to show up supernaturally. You know, there's going to be a building. No, God says if you have a vision and a passion and a purpose, when you ask according to it, I will open up the doors and the resources for you. Not just from this kingdom, from this church, but I'll open it up in the world. Look at what Isaiah says. It says, Isaiah 65, the wealth on the seas will be brought to you. To you, the riches of the nation will come. Your gates will always stand open. They will never shut day or night so that man may bring the wealth of the nation. 66, I will extend peace to her like a river and the wealth of the nations like a flood streaming in. In other words, God is saying, ask people. Don't be scared to ask. When you're passionate, God, man, it, is, it becomes something that is almost contagious. People want to be part of it. You're going to be surprised at how many people are going to say, how can I be involved in that dream and that purpose? Like Lawrence, when he speaks, there's passion in it. People will get stirred up in the church, outside of the church, everywhere. When you hear people's lives are being influenced, because why? God has called them to do something. And he's reacting from a standpoint of saying, my God is limitless, so I can ask. You're going to get 10 no's, but you might get a yes. We have to be, be like children. Children love asking. I, Andrew's favorite thing when he was two and three was, but why? But why? But why? You know how many times we heard, but why's? <laughs> Kaylee is, can I? Can I? She's, Right, right. I think this is more appropriate. And after 10, can I, can I have, can I have, can I have? After 10, she gets one. Because I want her to stop saying, can I? <laughs> right? Okay, so, so come to the kingdom of God like a child. Um, by asking, limitation is removed. When you ask, uh, we have to get more boldness. Okay. So a miracle was dependent on her ability of asking. A miracle was dependent on her ability to ask for help. So Elisha replied to her, How can I help you? Tell me, what do you have in your house? This is his reply. What do you have in your house? How can I help you? What do you have in your house? Now she was in the company of prophets. Elisha knows the situation. She kn he knows that her sons will be taken. He knows that she's angry. Her husband's dead. He knows that the prophets didn't have a lot of money. So she, when he died, she's left with basically nothing. He knew the situation. And he said to her that the, the, the statement, which I think would upset us, if he had to say to us, how can I help you? What do you have in your house? And what he was saying through that, through that statement is, you need to expect more. You need to have an expectation of God. Because I'm sure she went through her mind, nothing. What, Elisha, I need help. What do you have? I have nothing. I have nothing. I, I've got nobody in my life. I've got nothing. I've got no food. I've got nothing. I've got no friends. I've got nothing. Nothing. <laughs> nothing. <laughs> right? She's got nothing. You've got nothing. You know how many times I heard people say, I've got nothing? I have nothing. It's a response that we use. I've got nobody. How's your relationship? It's dead. There's nothing left in it. Elisha says, go and look at your house. I know you've got nothing. But go and look at your house again. Go and look at your house expecting something. Because we serve a God of hope that is able, that is love, and that is limitless. See, God can, can change our nothings into somethings. So she said, I've got nothing. And, and this is what, what the other thing that I love about Elisha. He didn't say, okay, so what's the problem? Oh, okay, you've got nothing. Okay, leave your problem with me. Come back in a week, and I'll have it solved for you. Because that's really what we want. That's what we want from our leaders. Is to say, I've got this problem. Here you go. Okay, I'm going to be back in a week, right? When I get back, could you, like, sort it out for me? Could we have it better? 
That's, that's really how we want things to work in the body, but that's not how it works. God is saying, go back to your house and look again. Elisha replied to her, how can I help you? Tell me what you have in your house. She said, your servant has nothing at all. So here's the challenge. What do you have in your house? And you've said, I've, I've just told you I've got nothing. But I believe God is saying, look again. Look again. Look again with expectation. Look again at your relationship. And when you say to me, listen, me and my husband, we're done. There's nothing left for us anymore. Go and look at it again. Expecting God through his incredible unlimitedness to come and to bring change. But if you don't want it, it's not going to be there. If you don't want the change, there's, there's still going to be nothing. If we go check our houses again, if you go check uh, not just our, our own homes, and, and I, I call a house as anything in your life, go those areas where you think there's nothing left, go and check it again and say, God, I trust you. I have an expectation for you to come into the situation and take the drop of oil that I have and turn it into a lifetime supply. That one smile that we still have, that one contact that I still have, that one open door that is almost closing, God, this is what I have. And come with an expectation. See, if, if we come with an accept, I've got nothing except. If our accept changes into expect, something changes. The results become miraculous. So we're going to end up with the last slide. I'm going to skip 24 of them. This is, wh this is what we have to get to. You say, I can't figure it out. God says, I will direct your steps. I've got nothing. I can't figure it out. God, but I'll take a step. God says, I will direct them. You say, I'm too tired. God says, I will give you rest. You say, it's impossible. God says all things are possible. You say nobody loves me. God says I love you. You say I can't forgive myself. God says I've forgiven you. You say it's not worth it. He says it will be worth it. He says you say I'm not smart enough. He says yes. I will give you wisdom. Amen. That's like a dramatical pause right there, right? It just adds a little bit. You say, I'm not able. He says, I am able. He says, I can't go. He says, my grace is sufficient. You say, I can't do it. He says, you can do all things through Christ who strengthens you. Amen. You say, I can't imagine. He says, I will supply all your needs. He says, you say, I'm afraid. He says, I haven't given you a spirit of fear, but of power, of a strong mind. You say, I feel alone. He says, I will never leave you, nor forsake you. Our God has a limitless response for our nothings, for our accepts. But we have to say, God, I want to, I want, I want it. I want to change. I want to, and I know I'm not going to get there miraculously just in one morning. But I want to get every single day, I want to take another step in the process to where you become limitless for my understanding. I know it's a process. I know it's a work. I know it's something that's going to take time, but, but if we are willing, I know I can see the 20s clicking to 30, the 30s clicking to 40, to 50, to 60, where we become a body that is so occupied with our God being limitless that we start impacting a world. Amen. 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 Let's pray.